Hi, I'm Sabin Yaakov. This presentation is entitled An Intuitive Explanation of Fluxgate Current Sensing, and this is a part one, what is a fluxgate? Let me say a few words of introduction. Fluxgate sensing has been around for many years now, originally developed for magnetic field measurements. Now, considering the relationship between current and magnetic field, flux gate can be used to sense current in various accuracy levels. In this presentation, the fundamentals of the flux gate technology is explained and demonstrated by describing some basic flux gate current sensing embodiment. This first part is just about the introduction, what is the flux gate? The second part will deal with measuring current with the flux gate, just circuitry involved to get current measurements. Let me go over some basic relationship here of nonlinear magnetics. If we have a ferromagnetic material which is nonlinear in the sense that it is getting into saturation, a typical BH curve will look like this. We have a region here which is sort of linear and then it goes into saturation. Now the derivative or the local derivative is the permeability, the local permeability, and this is the dB to dH at any given point. Now phi, the flux, is equal of course to the area times the magnetic flux density. We have also the voltage is n d phi dt. Also we have voltage L which is the inductance of say a body like this, the IDT. Again, we have here, because of the nonlinearity, different definition of inductance. I'm not going into it. There are some videos in my YouTube channels which are discussing this, just saying that there are some different definition of inductance. And then we have the total inductance is N phi over I. Now, total mu, of course, is the permeability in air or vacuum times the relative permeability, which again could be total or derivative. And finally, say the expression for the, in this case, the local inductance is n square a, a is the cross-section area of the core, mu zero and mu d, which is the local permeability, and the magnetic path length shown here. A very convenient way to deal with nonlinear inductors in simulation is by the feature that LT Spice has in which you can define the flux of an inductor in any expression that you wish. Very convenient is to use the Tangent's hyperbolic expression because it is resembling the typical BH curve of ferromagnetic material. And I'm showing here just a test circuit to show how is this equation or this expression behaving, okay? So what I'm having here is just this function itself. This is the function. And I'm running a, a parameter. This is the current. So it's the function is the function of this current like here, x is actually the current through the inductor. And also, I'm taking the derivative in order to see the local permeability. And here is what I'm getting. This is the typical Tangus hyperbolic curve, very similar to a BH curve. We see here sort of a linear portion. Here we have a pretty high derivative, which is related to permeability. And then, as it goes into saturation, the permeability or the derivative goes practically close to zero. In practical course, this may not be exactly straight line, it might be some slope to it, but this is a very nice approximation in any case. So now, let's have a look at the situation which is now approaching this issue of flux gate, in which I have a nonlinear inductor here the inductor, defined as 600 micro, should be Weber, and then this uh, 
function time gets hyperbolic x is the current through the inductor and here I have an excitation which is a square wave it's a square wave source generator with fairly high amplitude of a voltage it's a hundred volt and I've chosen here a 25 kilohertz frequency this is just an example of course just to emphasize the effects that we are interested here to see and also I have a serious resistor so we have an excitation voltage square wave a serious resistor and then we have a inductor which is non-linear defined by this expression so this inductor since the excitation is very high will be pushed all the way by the current uh, eventually penetrating the inductor and building up the magnetic flux density and eventually getting into the saturation region this is high enough to get into the saturation region here I'm just showing the flux itself this is the function of the flux so here I'm measuring the current of the inductor and this voltage shows actually the flux at any given moment of while running and then I have a derivative which sort of shows the derivative of the flux and this of course should be related to the voltage the expected voltage here this is just a sanity check because uh, here we can measure actually the voltage here this is this out but again this is just to see that we are okay so here is what I'm getting there are a number of plots here number of curves let's see first of all we have the excitation and then I'm showing the flux as you can see it's getting into saturation as expected we have the current of the source which is the current of the inductor the same current we have the voltage across the inductor and then this is the derivative and again it should be the same and it is the same because this is phi like the flux and the derivative of the flux is voltage so everything is okay so let's have a closer look at what is really happening here first of all we see that the flux and of course the flux density gets into saturation as expected and then we have some region here in which we have high current and low current and then the same thing for the voltage so let's try to explain it and I'm doing it by looking at this curve and then sort of sweeping along the cycle here to see what is really happening so let's start with this point here which correspond to this point and this point and here we are at the minimum point here and there is a voltage here so therefore we are starting to move up on this curve move on, on the curve actually B is moving up because of the voltage and uh, of course H is going up so this is this part here and here we are going up through the zero so this will be the zero point here we've reached this zero point this is zero flux zero b zero h at this point the inductor acts as an inductor the current looks like zero but it is not zero it is very small as compared to this current which we'll see later on is during saturation so just zooming in here you see that this is not zero definitely not zero the current is still going up still going up but it's a smaller value as compared to the current during saturation and indeed as we get into saturation here this is the maximum flux at this point the inductor actually collapses it's not an inductor anymore it's like a short circuit so therefore the current jumps to the value limited by the series resistor remember we have a square wave source a resistor and an inductor and then the inductor at this point is like a short so the current is determined by the series resistor 
So this explains this. At this time, the voltage across the inductor is zero because it's not an inductor anymore. Here, the inductor still sustains the voltage, which is pretty much the input voltage, that is the excitation, this voltage here, because the voltage drop on the resistor, 10 ohm, is very small. So basically what we see here is the voltage here. Very, very neat. So then we move to this portion here. Here we are at saturation. Current is maximum. Voltage is zero. Theoretically zero. And then of course we go back to the other end. So now I'm going to consider a case which again is related to the flux gate technology in which I am injecting an extra current sort of a bias current in this case it's DC it could be of low frequency or some higher frequency depending on the relationship between these frequencies so I'm injecting a current here to mimic the case in which the inductor is exposed to an external magnetic field. Okay, it's very difficult to actually implement a magnetic field into this uh, inductor. So I'm doing it by having this current source so that in fact we have an H here at the beginning, this is the bias, which results in some delta B above zero. So this will be our sort of starting point now the swing is not symmetrical anymore. It's going up to here, and then it'll go all the way to here. So again, this is in order to mimic the situation in which the inductor is exposed to an external magnetic field that can penetrate the windings, of course. And here is what I'm getting. So this is the excitation. This is the magnetic flux. You see it's going up and down, but you see it's non-symmetrical. The reason that it's not symmetrical is because we are starting with some bias point, so the distance to saturation in one side and the other side is not the same, so it takes different times. We can see it here, take different times, and therefore uh, we have here a longer time and here a shorter time. These slopes are also, by the way, not equal. It doesn't seem like that, but they are not equal. You can see this is sharper than this one. Now the voltage looks also chopped here. We see here a short duration and a longer duration. We explained what is the reason for the voltage. The voltage is during the time that they inductor is still behaving as an inductor. Now it is a short time now, Sh this one is a short time as compared to this time, so therefore this part here is shorter than this. This is of course uh, like uh, this. So we see that there is a major difference in the waveform. Okay, so clearly a external magnetic flux that will penetrate the inductor changes the situation and the waveforms here. So that if we have a way to measure th this change, then we can actually estimate or actually get a measure of the disturbance of the outside magnetic flux that penetrated the inductor. So let me just again compare the two the case of no injection symmetrical, this is the flux is symmetrical, the current is symmetrical, and the voltage is symmetrical. And with injection, we see here non-symmetrical case, the flux. This is then the current also is not symmetrical. And also the output voltage is not symmetrical. So how can we measure this deviation between the non-injection and injection case as a measure for the external field. There are many ways to do that, and I'm just mentioning here two. One is to look at the duty cycle. 
we have seen that this duty cycle is changing. So if I compare it to the no injection case, you see that this is symmetrical, this is not. So actually by measuring this duty cycle, we can tell as to whether we do have a injection which has moved the operating point to another point. But there is a better way, in fact a very clever and very sensitive way, and that is to use the second harmonics. Now what is the second harmonic? Second harmonic appears when a repetitive signal is not symmetrical, like we have it here. It's moving from symmetrical to non-symmetrical. A simple way to extract the second harmonic is to multiply the signal by the second harmonic waveform. Okay, so if I have a signal here, which of course breaks down into all the harmonics, and I multiply it by the second harmonic, then all the products of the waveform, which are of different frequency than the second harmonic, will produce an average of zero volt, this is geometry. And then only the case in which we have a second harmonic, that is if we have a component here which is of the second harmonic, then we are going to have a non-zero output. So by extracting the second harmonic, we can tell as to whether a waveform is symmetrical because the second harmonic appears when you have a non-symmetrical wave. So let's have a look at it here. You see that in the symmetrical case, this is, I'm looking at the current now, I'm multiplying it by the second harmonics, and you see that here it's zero, here there is some value, but this value is positive, because this is negative, the current, and the second harmonic is negative. So we have a product which is plus. And then here we have a current which is positive and the second harmonic is negative, so therefore we have a negative value here. And therefore, and since this is symmetrical, the average of this thing is zero. So this is why when you look at FFT, which is done in a different way, sort of a more digital way, uh, we see that we can recognize the first harmonic and the third harmonic, there's practically no second harmonic here, okay? On the other hand, if after injection we have this shift in the symmetry, you see that after multiplying the current waveform by the second harmonics, we are getting this product, which is clearly non-symmetrical in terms of plus and minus, and therefore there is an average which is different from zero because this is smaller than this. And this is why we see here this second harmonic, which is really significant here, okay? So by extracting the second harmonic, an AC signal, average it, get the DC value, which will tell you what is the value of the second harmonic. So this would be one way to observe as to whether you have an injection of a I'm showing it as a current, but we are interested in a magnetic field. So this brings me to the end of this uh, short presentation. As I have said, there is a second part in which I'm going to show some actual implementation of current sensing using this technique of flux gate. By no means it's not going to cover everything, but it's going to cover, I think, sufficiently to understand what are the possibilities there. And let me just state that there are some current sensor based on the flux gauge which are extremely accurate and stable. So thank you for your attention. I hope you found it of interest and perhaps it will be useful to you in the future. Thank you very much.